So hello everyone, good afternoon and, and uh, my name is Rita Vahilsma and I would like to welcome you all to continue this immunology seminars which we started in the spring and, and, and we organized these together between the Finnish Society of Immunology and, and Inflames Research Program. Um, we, we will have four seminars uh, this, this fall and it's my great a pleasure to, to start it by, by welcoming Satu Mustioki. Uh, Satu is professor in, in uh, translational hematology, and she also is a director of translational immunology at the University of Helsinki. Um, she, um, she has uh, also a specialty in, in clinical chemistry and, and runs her, her research groups in, in biomedicum in Helsinki. So Satu is expert in hematology uh, since many years, and, and uh, more recently she has been very active also in, in the area of, of um, oncoimmunology, as, as well as um, understanding molecular mechanisms of immune-mediated diseases. And Satu has made really seminal uh, uh, findings in, in, the, in, in terms of identifying somatic mutations and, and their role not only in malignancies, but also in non-malignant diseases. And, and this is something she's also been awarded, for instance, ERC grant and, and uh, published in, in really uh, great, great journals. More recently, in New England Journal, she published a review uh, explaining what this is about. Uh, today, we are going to hear about somatic mutations in non-malignant immune-mediated diseases, and we are really looking forward to your talk. Satu, welcome. Thank you, Rita, <clears throat> and thank you for all the organizers for the kind uh, invitation to, to participate uh, today and, and give the presentation. So, um, as uh, was uh, introduced, so my topic is somatic mutations in non-malignant uh, immune-mediated diseases. And uh, uh, first, I, I will start uh, describing the mechanisms, what we know currently about how mutations are forming and, uh, in normal cells. Of course, it has been uh, known uh, long ago uh, that how, how important they are in, in cancer and their role in cancer. But only like uh, during the last uh, five or ten years, uh, we have learned more of their role uh, in the normal cells. Then uh, shortly introduce the tissue clonality and, and what the somatic mutated cells, uh, how uh, they uh, can proliferate there in various tissues and what we know about the somatic mutations uh, associated currently with some of the uh, non-malignant diseases. And then um, I will uh, go more into details, uh, somatic mutations in immune cells, and especially as our group has been mostly studying somatic mutations in T cells, I will introduce a couple of uh, our, our model diseases, what we have been studying and, and what have been uh, our discoveries. And I, I think that this is a great topic as there is a really a lot to learn. I, I think that we are just in there in the top of the iceberg at, at the moment. And I, I really look forward that, that we will understand much, much more uh, uh, of, of this uh, subject uh, in the future. So happy to hear your, your comments and, and, and looking forward your ideas. Um, so this is the... Uh, picture of, of like general uh, mutagenesis. So of course, this is not only in the normal cells, but uh, uh, also in cancer, but how, how, how uh, mutations are, are forming. So uh, as we know, our uh, cells are dividing. Some of the cells are dividing uh, less frequently uh, compared to the others, but it, it's really a complex process. And, and because of this complexity, there are many different uh, parts uh, which can go wrong. So um, and, and there can these mutations be formed. This is an example of some of the mutation processes uh, related to DNA mutations. Uh, so, for example, when a DNA is replicating, there could, can be replication errors. And in normal conditions, these replication errors are, are corrected. But if the uh, repair mechanisms are defected, uh, so uh, defective, uh, so then uh, they are not uh, uh, corrected. 
And there could be, for example, insertion of an uh, incorrect number of these nucleotides there, or, or wrong nucleotides, and or some of the nucleotides are, are uh, deleted. Then there is a possibility of uh, these kind of external factors. So we know that there are several different mutagens that can uh, directly cause DNA damage. Here are uh, some examples of, uh, for example, uh, the reactive oxygen species, aldehyde uh, uh, retroviruses, uh, so uh, like endogenous uh, factors, and then uh, UV light uh, is, is very typical re radiation and, and chemicals, for example, in the tobacco smoke and alcohol that can cause uh, direct uh, DNA damage. Then there is uh, this kind of a spontaneous uh, mutation process, uh, which is especially uh, related also to uh, aging. So deamination and uh, that uh, can uh, cause then uh, changes uh, in the cytosine and also de uh, depurination. So currently as, as these uh, sequencing efforts have continued, uh, it has been possible to calculate how frequent these mutations are, are in normal cells. And uh, if we consider um, the whole, whole genome of the cells. So uh, it's now calculated that somatic cells uh, uh, acquire approximately one to two mutations per cell division, per mitosis. And, and when we think that how many times they divide, that will mean that actually they, uh, the normal cells have a lot of mutations. And uh, some of these mutations are passenger mutations and they do not have any, any effect. But as, as also in cancer, uh, some of these mutations can have functional effects. And I, I think that currently we do not really know enough how these mutations are also impacting the function of, of the normal cells. Um, also, there, there are differences in the different uh, genomic areas. So how frequent the mutations are and, and how, how easily they form there. For example, the uh, uh, GC-rich content uh, is uh, in the genome is, is area of, of mutations and, and some changes related to methylation. Also chromatin conformation, is it like the condensed chromatin or, or open chromatin? And also the transcriptional, transcriptional activity impacts uh, the uh, base sub substitutions uh, in, in the normal uh, genome. Then uh, what was first observed in cancer, and now the similar signatures have been also observed uh, in healthy cells, is this kind of a typical like mutation signature patterns. So depending like the mutagen process, whether it's, it's coming, for example, from the UV light, we can see that uh, there is uh, the mutations are, are like typically, uh, for example, in this UV light signature, there is a predominance of these uh, CC to uh, TT denucleotide uh, mutations uh, because of this formation of these py uh, pyramine uh, dimers. And, and also this deamination is a typical of age-related signature. Of course, uh, when uh, the mutations in the whole uh, genome is, are, are analyzed, so they are not only including uh, like a one uh, mutation signature, but this is like the predominant signature, uh, what, what can be observed. And then, uh, for example, when those cells of, of the skin uh, are analyzed, so then uh, we can see more of this, uh, for example, the UV light uh, uh, related mutations, or, or for example, uh, in, in the esophagus, uh, we can see the tobacco, uh, tobacco related mutations. And also uh, depending then, uh, uh, of, of the whole lifetime exposure to these uh, different areas. So the sing similar signatures can be seen both in, in cancer, but, but also uh, in normal cells. And when the uh, tissues are, are now analyzed, so the current methods have, have um, enabled like the analysis of, of the uh, tissue heterogeneity. So if we consider like that, we will take a small piece of uh, tissue. We can consider this is, for example, the skin. And, and then within that tissue, there are actually several, could be several hundreds of different clones. Uh, meaning like that uh, they are uh, 
clonally expanded uh, and, and there can be like a similar mutation profile. And then depending on uh, whether, for example, the mutations have been al already uh, uh, developing in a post-psychotic phase or, or whether they have evolved later, uh, we, we can see differences in, in the clone size and, and also uh, in, in the function uh, of, of these clones. Uh, environment overall, the, so the tissue overall uh, is uh, also shaped by, by this different, um, for example, inflammation or, or DMA damage is, is um, affecting this uh, clonal structure here within the tissue. And then uh, these, some of these clones can, uh, can uh, be participating in like the benign proliferation. And of course, there is also a possibility that some of these uh, evolve into the cancer. But now we, when we understand like this um, huge complexity or huge amount of mutation, actually the cancer is, is only one small part of that. And, and now we just somehow need to shift uh, like our, our thinking so that the, the mutations and clones, they do not mean like that, that cancer evolves, but, but they can have um, also other, other kinds of effects uh, in normal tissues. And furthermore, when we consider these different tissues, we, we also need to consider uh, when the mutations are occurring, for example, the developmental states, if the mutations occurs already uh, in, at the very early age, or if it's occurring later, uh, uh, whether uh, it is occurring, uh, for example, in the cells, uh, which have a self-renewal capacity, like in stem cells, or whether uh, the mutation is, is occurring in very much uh, uh, differentiated cells. So then the effects or, or the impact uh, to the function can be quite different. Also, the overall, like uh, this, all those di dimension can be divided in, in different uh, di directions. So what is like the overall uh, cell fate, uh, what, is, what kind of like a signaling uh, procedure is, is go ongoing there, and, uh, and also uh, is there some uh, external uh, inflammation or, or some cell-cell interactions uh, which are playing a role. So overall, like this impact of these mutations and impact of these mutated clones, um, it's varying a lot uh, 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 and it's impacted uh, with these uh, different uh, kinds uh, of factors. The first discoveries of these somatic mutations uh, they were published around uh, 2015. And uh, this is an uh, example of, of those one very early uh, publications in science. And then uh, they studied, they, they took like this kind of very small pieces of the skin and then they uh, tried to separate or, or see like the clones uh, in there. And what was surprising that time was that uh, first of all, uh, like the mutations burden in the normal skin, it was, actually quite close uh, even even to the cancer so it, it, it's not like that that the mutation burden is very low in normal skill and then it's it's a huge in cancer there is some difference but still uh, uh, the normal skin can have quite a high mutation load and also when we are comparing like the um, the genes which are mutated. So they are surprisingly similar uh, here uh, in cancer patients or, or in cancer tissues and, and uh, normal skin. So for example, the NOTS mutations, they were very frequent both in cancer and, and um, in normal skin. Uh, also here, for example, this FAT1 and even the TP53 mutations, they were all also occurring in the normal skin, uh, similarly as, as they're uh, in, in cancer. And, and this was done uh, with this kind of a, a targeted panel, including uh, the cancer genes, but later uh, publications have analyzed also the uh, whole exome sequencing or even whole genome sequencing of, of these uh, mutated skins. And for example, when they are comparing uh, the area of the skin, uh, if it has been like under the uh, sunlight, or from those kind of areas which are, are, are not uh, with the contact with the direct sunlight. So there can be changes in both in the mutation pattern, but uh, also in the number uh, of mutations. The other uh, example here uh, is uh, from uh, esophagus. 
And here clearly, uh, when they were looking like the number of mutations in normal esophagus, so these were not cancer patients. Uh, uh, and then they looked at the age uh, of the patients. So they saw that they were clear correlations. So meaning the older we get, the more mutations we have. And, and of course, it's, it's quite self-evident like that these mutations are, are accumulating, but uh, I still think it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting phenomenon. And similarly, like in, in cancer, uh, uh, in, in the skin cancer, we can see that uh, also in the esophagus, we can see these cancer-associated mutations, for example, TP53, and uh, they were quite uh, same uh, in, in associated cancers. Uh, this is now an example uh, of the different like uh, individuals that, that they were sequenced. And, and these kind of like a small dots, they mean that they had like a small clones there. And the larger the dot is, is like meaning like the larger clone, meaning like that there are uh, more cells expand, uh, uh, carrying uh, the same mutation uh, signature. And here you can see that uh, these patients uh, had uh, mutations, for example, in TP53, Notch1, and, and these other uh, genes. And what was also noticed that although they were non-smokers, uh, which had uh, the mutation pattern, uh, the similar mutation pattern, but overall, like these mutations, uh, they were related uh, to, for example, to alcohol consumption and, and also for tobacco uh, smoking. And, and that has been also shown in the follow-up uh, publications. Then uh, when we come uh, from these solid tumors or, or solid tissues uh, to, to blood, so um, it was already published uh, uh, in 2014, the first publications related to so-called like a clonal hematopoiesis. And the clonal hematopoiesis uh, is meaning like that the mutations are occurring here uh, in the um, stem cells, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and they got uh, this kind of proliferation advantage. And, and then when we sequence the blood samples, then we can uh, observe that there are uh, uh, mutated cells. And, and usually, uh, for example, the mutations variant alert frequencies are just like 2%, uh, up to 10%, but, but there can be also uh, larger clones. And, and also here, when we are looking like the age distribution of the patients, so uh, younger, uh, not the patients, but healthy controls, they have a lower frequency of this uh, clonal hematopoiesis, but older we get, uh, the more also clonal our uh, hematopoietic cells are. And depending then on the sequencing methods, uh, we can see that uh, even people aged at 50 years uh, with a very sensitive sequencing methods, uh, almost all of us have uh, these uh, mutations, clonal hematopoiesis mutations in, in our blood. These were shown to be related, for example, to the increase of acute mild leukemias, but that's very low risk. But what is uh, even more interesting is that uh, there has been shown to be associated with this kind of inflammatory processes. So as these mutations are occurring, for example, uh, in the myeloid cells, in monocytes, macrophages, it's now thought like that they can cause this kind of uh, inflammatory cytokine production, uh, which can be a risk factor, for example, for cardiovascular diseases. So overall, um, there is also studies uh, that has sequenced almost all the tissues in the body, so in the, all the normal tissues. And then we can see that uh, in, in these tissues, there is a, like a typical uh, mutation profile uh, in, in, in different uh, parts, uh, in different tissue types. But also some of the mutations are, for example, related to uh, regeneration of the tissue, for example, uh, in liver. It has been shown that uh, in, in uh, chirotic uh, liver, uh, when uh, the liver tries to repair that, so then uh, that uh, like repaired tissues has a, a typical mutation profile. So meaning like that actually it can be like a beneficial process uh, when, when these uh, mutations are forming and then it allows the tissue uh, to, to expand. Um, 
what about the diseases? So um, as I said, so earlier these somatic mutations were only related to cancer, but now we know already quite many different diseases that are associated uh, with the somatic mutations. Some of those diseases are, are so-called like a pheno, pheno copies. For example, this uh, autoimmune lymphoprotective syndrome. So initially it was uh, shown that it's uh, associated with the germline uh, defects in the FAS gene. But then later it has been shown that it's also possible uh, like that uh, hematopoietic stem cells are uh, are having uh, somatic mutations in the FAST genes, and, and then they can uh, have similar, like a phenocopy of that uh, uh, inherited germline disease. Then uh, there are some of these local diseases, for example, in the arteriovenous malformations, uh, there has been shown that there are somatic KRAS mutations uh, that are inducing the disease. Um, also in some neurological diseases, uh, for example, mTOR mutations have been occurring. Uh, in colitis, uh, we have now observed a, a typical mutation profile, uh, which is then differing actually from, from the cancer of, of the colon. Uh, then uh, this is an example of par paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and, and this was the disease that was already discovered uh, some decades ago, and there is a mutations in the hematopoietic stem cells in the uh, pig uh, A gene, and that is causing the defect in, uh, in the uh, glycophospholipid anchor, and then causing uh, this uh, lysis of these red cells. So nowadays uh, there is a lot uh, of these different diseases, and actually in this New England Journal of Review, so there is a supplementary table where we have tried to collect uh, many of those diseases. So if you are more interested in the different spectrum of, of these benign diseases with somatic mutation background, I, I suggest you to look uh, in, in that table in, in more detail. But then going more uh, to the immune cell direction. So what do we know about the somatic mutations and immune response? So uh, as mentioned, for example, this um, uh, ALPS disease, so this uh, lymphoproliferation, uh, normally it's, it's uh, caused by the uh, germline defect, but there has been now also cases with this uh, somatic uh, defect uh, in the FAST gene, and, and that is, uh, consoled, uh, that is causo, uh, causing the lymphoproliferation. Similarly, uh, I'll show examples of, for example, the somatic stathory mutations, and, and there are also uh, germline uh, stathory mutations, which are inducing a bit similar uh, phenotype. But, but then there are uh, these selective immune cell mutations, meaning like that the mutations have not occurred there uh, in the uh, earlier uh, stem cell phase, but more uh, in the uh, already differentiated uh, cells. For example, they can be uh, gain-of-function mutations uh, in T cells or, or B cells, uh, which can uh, cause either that they are like uh, resistant to the uh, apoptosis or, or they are able to proliferate. And um, there is very uh, recent publications uh, in uh, uh, related to B-cell defects uh, in uh, Sjögren syndrome. So there is a problem of, of these antibodies. And now it, um, it was shown that actually uh, the B-cells which are producing uh, these, uh, these uh, autoantibodies, so uh, they are having the mutations in the lymphoma associated genes. And it seems that uh, these mutations are causing like that those cells are able to evade uh, from the uh, normal like auto destruction, meaning like that this is kind of like immune evasion mechanisms uh, for, for this uh, uh, auto reactive uh, B cells. And, and probably also in some conditions uh, when the mutations are occurring uh, in, the, in the target cells, uh, then uh, these um, T cell responses uh, can occur uh, against uh, the uh, uh, abnormal mutation profile there uh, in the target cells. So our interest to this field uh, stems from this uh, so-called LGL leukemia. So LGL uh, stands for large granular lymphocytes. And here in this picture, you can see this kind of a, a lymphocytes, which is larger in size. 
and has these small dots, these granules there uh, in the cytoplasm. So normally these uh, LGL cells are either uh, CD8 positive T cells or, or NK cells. And similarly, also in this condition, uh, the majority of this LGL disease is caused by uh, expansion of, of the CD3 positive, CD8 positive effector memory uh, T cells. In a, approximately 15% of the cases, uh, there is NK cell expansion, and in some cases also CD4 cell expansion. Uh, earlier, it has been detected by this kind of clonal T cell re, uh, receptor rearrangement, but we know that this kind of a clonal uh, T cell receptor rearrangement can also occur uh, in, in other conditions, so it's not uh, anyhow uh, specific. Uh, what has been considered related to this LGL leukemia, so it it's, has been like under debate, is, is that cancer or, or is it autoimmune disease? The phenotype of, of the T cells, it's, it's, they are approximately like normal uh, terminally differentiated cytotoxic T cells. And, and putatively, there has been some autoantigen or, or some viral antigen, uh, which is like causing the initial driver uh, or initial expansion of, of this mutation. It has been already shown 20 years ago that STAT3 activation is very typical in this uh, LGL lymphoproliferation, and also probably, uh, for example, IL-15 is important uh, for maintaining uh, the proliferation of these LGL cells. There is also dysregulation of these apoptotic pathways, for example, in, in the fast fas ligand -like system, and, and also in the uh, cell survival pathways. What was then discovered now already almost 10 years ago was that uh, we found that approximately in half of these CD8 positive cases, there are somatic mutations in the STAT3 gene, and the most of the mutations are occurring here uh, in the SH2 domain of the STAT3. In our later uh, uh, follow-up studies, we have also found mutations to be located in other parts of the STAT3, but mostly they are here in the SH2 domain. Uh, when we have sequenced these samples, so the mutations are only there uh, in the expanded T cell population so that they have not occurred there in the stem cell phase, but, but they're uh, in the late uh, uh, T cell uh, differentiation. And they, they are causing constitutive uh, STAT3 uh, activation. Also, uh, what is quite interesting that uh, if the disease is a CD4 a positive uh, LGL lymphoproliferation, then the mutations are occurring uh, in the uh, sister gene uh, in the STAT5B. And uh, also these patients have very like mild phenotypes. So usually there is only this uh, lymphoproliferation, but uh, not other symptoms. And it's quite intriguing because actually these same STAT5B mutations can also be discovered in the uh, T cell, uh, like aggressive T cell malignancies. And, and there they are caused, thought to be like they're really the drivers of the disease. So what is the uh, difference here uh, in, in these uh, very mild lymphoproliferations and, and then this aggressive disease, but that, that is still uh, unknown. And quite similarly, as, as we consider uh, these uh, solid uh, tissues, for example, the skin. So why the same TP53 mutations are, are just sitting there in, in the uh, skin tissues and, and, and otherwise in the cancer, they, they are considered to be very uh, damaging uh, driver mutations in, in the cancer. Um, what was then uh, discovered was also that uh, these uh, same STAT3 mutations uh, can be found in very severe, uh, severely ill children, uh, which have uh, uh, this uh, lymphoproliferation, uh, similar as, as this LGL leukemia and, and severe autoimmunity. And they were these novel germline activating uh, STAT3 mutations. So earlier it has been already shown like this uh, loss of function that three mutations are related to this hyper IgE syndrome, but, but now these uh, activating that three mutations, they were cause, causing this early uh, onset severe uh, autoimmunity. So um, as we know that this LGL lymphoproliferation is, is very closely related to the rheumatoid arthritis, um, approximately 25% of, of the patients have also rheumatoid arthritis. We also wanted to study how these somatic STAT3 mutations are associated with rheumatoid arthritis. So firstly, uh, we saw that uh, 
approximately one fourth of the patients, they have multiple STAT3 mutations, and the mutations were either in different CD8 T cell clones or even in the same clone, there can be like a different uh, uh, STAT3 mutations. And then when we were looking at these patients, this uh, co occurrence of, of these uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we could see that the patients who had this multiple of the STAT3 mutations, they had more often this rheumatoid arthritis compared to the patients without the STAT3 mutations. Then we also studied uh, this, uh, like a rare form of uh, LGL, uh, 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 rare form of rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, here, first, uh, so Sorry. So first, we, we, we considered that if this LGL leukemia can be like a model uh, for, for this autoimmune disease or cancer. So what about do these other, other autoimmune disease patients have also mutations uh, uh, either in the STAT3 or, or in other uh, immune regulation pathways? As the idea here was that uh, when, when the cells are proliferating, uh, either for, for the external course or, or from autoantigen, the cell proliferation during that process, uh, they can get these uh, mutations. And then depending uh, on the mutated genes and also the antigen target of that uh, uh, mutated cells, that can also then impact uh, uh, like the phenomenon uh, of, of the disease or, or the function of, of those cells. But now, uh, when we were looking at uh, these uh, other, uh, uh, other patients, so we first started from rheumatoid arthritis. So these were newly diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis patients. And, and we, we collected their blood samples. And then uh, we selected, we sorted out their T cells, uh, CD4 cells and, and CD8 uh, T cells. And first, uh, we looked uh, like uh, what is the clonal st uh, structure in these T cells. First with the uh, V-beta flow cytometry analysis and also later with the T-cell receptor sequencing. And overall, we could see that CD8 cells are, are more clonal than the CD4 cell uh, uh, part. And what was still quite interesting was that when we compared like the healthy controls, which were age-matched to rheumatoid arthritis patients, there were no difference uh, in, in the clonality. So actually the uh, rheumatoid arthritis patient didn't have more clonal T cells, al al although it has been like suggested that uh, uh, before. Then uh, when the clonality uh, was compared to the age, uh, we could see similarly here, like the T cell clonality is increasing. So um, the older we get, uh, the more clonal T cells uh, we have. Then when we were uh, sequencing these T cells, so we sequenced these uh, CD8 and CD4 T cells with this uh, very uh, deep uh, targeted panel con consisting of 1000 uh, genes. We could uh, see that uh, especially there in the CD8 positive T cells of with rheumatoid arthritis, we could discover these uh, somatic mutations. And also that the, some of the mutations, they were uh, located in the genes that have been related to uh, rheumatoid arthritis in the earlier GIVAS uh, studies, for example, in, in, in the PADI4 uh, 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 gene. And also in, in this patient that we could observe that this mutation uh, is, is causing a, a, a STAT3 uh, uh, activation. Uh, in, in these CD8 cells. But in this first publication or in this first study, we didn't found any recurrent mutation, meaning like that all these mutations, what we found, they were only found in individual patients. So not, not uh, in, in other patients, the same mutations were, were discovered. But then uh, we were uh, studying this uh, rare form of rheumatoid arthritis called Felty syndrome. Uh, so these patients are treated in rheumatology clinic. So they are not treated in hematology clinic, but these patients have also neutropenia. So uh, the disease is a little bit like a mimicking this LGL lymphoproliferation. And then it was quite interesting to see that approximately almost half of these Felty syndrome patients, they also had the same uh, gain of function STAT3 mutations that those LGL uh, patients have had. So suggesting that actually uh, these two diseases are, are very much uh, uh, interconnected and maybe just like a continuum uh, of one uh, disease uh, spectrum. 
So this was uh, an example how these uh, somatic mutations, uh, uh, recurrent somatic statory mutations are also occurring uh, in some uh, forms of autoimmune disease. Also, um, in some other publications uh, studying uh, multiple scler sclerosis samples, uh, somatic STAT3 mutations have been found, and also uh, in patients with a celiac disease. Um, so when biopsies have been taken uh, from, the, from, the, uh, fr from the gut, uh, there, there can be seen a clonally uh, expanded uh, T-cells with these uh, somatic STAT3 mutations. Then uh, we have also studied other uh, autoimmune diseases, and, and this is an example of aplastic anemia. So aplastic anemia is, is very severe uh, hematological autoimmune disease. Their uh, patients are losing uh, all their uh, blood cells, meaning like that uh, in, in the uh, bone marrow, there is, uh, uh, there is no more like uh, either red blood cells forming cells or, or uh, white blood forming cells. And, and the patients have very low uh, both white blood cell count, hemoglobin, and, and platelet uh, values. And what has already been known before is, is that uh, this is, um, this is um, the disease is caused by these cytotoxic T cells that are for some reason then attacking uh, uh, against this uh, 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 normal bone marrow cells. But the target antigens in, in those T cells are, are not known. And here uh, we collected uh, similarly uh, these patients, uh, both from bone marrow samples and, and from peripheral blood, uh, uh, and separated T cells, and, uh, CD4 T cells, and CD8 cells. And, and similarly, here in the aplastic anemia patients, we observed that uh, CD8 positive T cells had more of these somatic mutations than the CD4 positive T cells. And they were also different uh, in, for the healthy uh, controls. However, uh, also in the healthy controls, uh, we can observe that there are these somatic mutations. If we are looking, so how big these clones are, they're in the CD4 cells. So most of the clones are less than 10%. So there were like a two, 3% clones. But in some cases, there are also a larger proportion of, of those uh, CD8 cells, for example, are, are belonging uh, to the same clone. Uh, here, uh, when we were looking how these mutations are related to clonality, so if we uh, combine both uh, the patients and the healthy controls, we can see that the mutation burden uh, is, is related to the T-cell clonality, but that's actually more clearly only happening in these aplastic anemia patients and, and not that clearly uh, in the healthy controls. And, and then when analyzing these different mutations, so also here uh, we discovered STAT3 mutations to be part in those CD8 T cells, but also the other mutations, they were more enriched uh, to this uh, JAK-STAT signaling pathways and, and MAP kinase signaling pathways. However, although we didn't find STAT3 somatic mutations in healthy controls, uh, some of the other mutated genes uh, in this JAK stat pathway were also discovered in the healthy controls. So it's not only unique that they are occurring here uh, in the autoimmune uh, disease uh, patients. This is just an example of uh, one, uh, uh, one patient. Actually, the patients developed uh, this aplastic anemia after this severe viral infection. The patient had uh, this uh, spine flu infection when that was already like almost 10 years ago, we had this uh, spine flu break. And uh, after that patient was hospitalized because of the pneumonia and gradually uh, the patient started to develop uh, this kind of uh, loss of the bone marrow cells. And, and then the aplastic anemia uh, was, was diagnosed and uh, we received several samples uh, before the treatment and then during the treatment and, and also couple of years after when the patients have uh, covered from the aplastic anemia. When the T-cell receptor uh, sequencing was done, uh, we observed that there were these two large expanded clones there uh, in this patient. And, and then in this last sample, when patients had uh, recovered from the disease, uh, we could see that the clones have the clone size uh, ha ha has uh, diminished. Uh, then when we sequenced the sample, uh, we separated these, both of these clones separately. And uh, it was interesting to see 
this uh, somatic stathry mutations occurring uh, only in one of these clones. So uh, in this VP5.1 uh, uh, clone and, and not in the other uh, clone and, and also not in the other cells. And then when we studied in, in more uh, uh, detail uh, how, how this mutation are, are affecting the phenotype and function of the cells, this is single cell RNA sequencing of this patient sample. And it was interesting to see that these mutated STAT3 uh, cells had really clearly a uh, distinct phenotype in this single cell RNA sequencing, uh, as, as normally these CD8 cells are, are clustering here together with the other CD8 cells and, and NK cells. Also, when we look like the transcriptome profile, uh, so this uh, uh, STAT3 mutated clone differed clearly from the other uh, CD8 cells, and, and these had a more cytotoxic uh, profile uh, here uh, in the gene expression analysis. So all, all this suggesting that uh, these patients can have these clonal cells, uh, which have uh, these uh, somatic mutations uh, that are all, uh, clearly uh, impacting uh, impacting the function of the cells. Of course, at this moment, we are not able to see are they really the cause of the disease or, or are they just like a keeping up the apparent uh, immune cell proliferation there or, or keeping up some apparent, um, uh, for example, the cytokine production, but uh, at least they seem to be more common uh, uh, in, the, in the patients and, and the patients have also the, the typical uh, mutation profile. And, and the last example comes also from the hematologic area from the graft versus host disease. And this graft versus host disease is uh, occurring or, or it's, it's quite common like a side effect uh, of the allergenic uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So when leukemia patients are, 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 are not treated uh, successfully with a normal chemotherapy or targeted therapy, so then there is a need for, for this uh, allergenic stem cell transmutation, meaning like that all the hematopoiesis and also actually the immune system is, is then transferred uh, from the uh, uh, unrelated donor. And the problem here is, then is that these donor cells, they are not only killing the leukemia cells, but they are also then targeting uh, the host uh, tissues. And, and uh, we thought like that this, uh, this is a, a time when there is a really strong, strong like immune activation. And it has already been known earlier that these patients had like a clonally uh, expanded CD8 cells and also CD4 cells, and, and we wanted to see, is there a typical, like the mutation profile, uh, what can be found in, in these cells. So this is one patient case uh, from which we started uh, this process, and, and actually quite interesting, the, this patient had uh, one big uh, CD4 cell clone, so uh, usually they are CD8 cells, but, but this patient has CD4 cell clone. And when we were following this patient now for six years, so we can see that the same clone persisted there. So um, that it, it's not only related to, to some of uh, the viral infection or something, but it, it was persisting here all the time. And also when we did uh, the deep TCR sequencing, uh, we, can, we can see that uh, this is almost like a monoclonal expansion there uh, in these sorted cells. So the phenotype of these CD4 cells, they seem to be uh, these effector memory cells or, or TEMRA cells. And also quite interestingly, when, when just first looking with the Cranzyme B expression, as Cranzyme B is thought to be like a marker of, of cytotoxic cells, so we can see that uh, about half of these CD4 cells also expressed quite high amount of this Cranzyme B. Then uh, when we were further uh, Analyzing, uh, doing uh, the sequencing, we, we discovered that this uh, clone, expanded clone, had uh, three, well, it had about like a 10 mutations, but the main mutations uh, that caught our attention were the mutations in mTOR. Uh, mTOR, uh, for example, mTOR inhibitors, they are already used as a treatment for these graft versus host disease patients. We also discovered the mutations in nf kappa B2, and, and for example, the germ limitations have been uh, related to, to this uh, common variable uh, immune deficiency. And also then uh, there were some mutations in the TLR2 uh, gene. So uh, 
all these mutations were like relatively uh, interesting mutations. And, and for example, in this mTOR mutation that was located here in the uh, kinase domain of the mutations, uh, where uh, also like in cancer patients, the mutations uh, have been shown to have an uh, impact on, on function uh, to cells. So therefore, uh, we, we selected all these three to, to do functional analysis and to better understanding the impact of, of the mutation. First, when we were following up these patients, also the mutation load, we can see that the mutation load was quite stable. It a little bit increased uh, here, uh, for example, with these mTOR mutations, but, uh, but it was the same clone and the same mutations were observed in uh, all the different time point. As, as this patient had also the sibling donor, so we were able to actually um, get the cells from the donor. And, and when we sequenced the donor cells, we didn't find the mutation, meaning like that these mutations have occurred uh, there uh, in the patients uh, probably during the, this immune uh, operation process. And also what was interesting to see was that now when we uh, screened a larger amount of these uh, graft versus host disease patients, so this same mutation, it was recurrent so that we discuss, uh, discovered also other GVHD patients which had exactly the same uh, mTOR uh, mutation. Uh, NF-kappa B2 mutations was not discovered in other patients, but actually this TLR2 mutations was also uh, discovered in part of the healthy control. So therefore we didn't consider that to be uh, like the driver mutation in this disease. Then uh, when this patient had uh, these affected organs where, for example, skin and liver, so this graft versus host disease uh, uh, occurred there, we could see that uh, the skin uh, had uh, the same mutated cells uh, in the affected skin. And, and also when, when looking here uh, with the staining, we can see that there are those CD4 uh, positive uh, cells uh, there uh, in, in the skin tissue, which had uh, then this uh, mutation. So then uh, we created a construct uh, of all these uh, different, uh, three different uh, mutations. And, and also uh, we had uh, this uh, triple mutation here, uh, which had all these uh, three uh, different mutations together. And, and we noticed that uh, this, uh, especially this mTOR mutation uh, is causing the activation uh, of this mTOR signaling pathway. And when we're looking, uh, for example, this uh, phospho acts, uh, uh, phospho uh, S6K1 and S6, we can see that they were uh, increased here uh, in this uh, mutated compared to the wild type. And suggesting like this uh, mutation is in increasing the apparent activation both for this uh, mTORC1 and mTORC2 uh, pathways. Then when we were following those cell proliferation, we could see that uh, it was uh, slightly inducing like the higher amount of the cell proliferation here. And, and when those cells were starved, uh, we noticed that uh, it was able to uh, like save the cells. So they were a little bit uh, resistant to this uh, apoptosis under these uh, starving conditions. So su suggesting that this is a, a gain of a function mutation, which is uh, in, uh, inducing also um, beneficial cell proliferation and, and, and uh, anti-apoptotic uh, effects. We were also performing a single cell RNA sequencing from this patient. And as we know, uh, the TCR, what these clonal cells are carrying, we combine that with the T cell receptor sequencing. And there we could follow uh, exactly the phenotype of these cells. We noticed that uh, these cells had apparent uh, cytotoxic uh, phenotype, the CD4 cells, and this largest uh, clone uh, uh, had the mutations here. So uh, these mTOR mutations were located in this uh, cytotoxic effector uh, T cell uh, phenotype. Uh, this is a more detailed example how, how those clones had these different uh, uh, cytotoxic enzymes such as transzyme A, B, uh, perforins, granulysins. Uh, and as you can see, if you look at the normal CD4 cells, usually these genes are, are not expressed there. Also, the signaling pathways, uh, TNF-alpha signaling pathways and, and MIG target signaling pathways uh, were activated uh, in these uh, mutated uh, cells. 
So uh, we also then wanted to see, so are, are these cells somehow targeting the patient's own tissue? And, and for that, uh, we were um, extracting a patient fibroblasts and, and we were growing those fibroblasts. And, and then we were also sorting out these mutated CD4 cells and, and then uh, the normal CD8 cells. And we, when we're looking uh, uh, with this uh, real-time uh, cytotoxicity analysis uh, with this isoligence assay, uh, here is example when, so effector cells are added there on the top of these fibroblasts. So this is like a positive control, this NK92 cell line, uh, which is known to kill those cells. So we can uh, see the uh, decrease here in, in the impedance. And, but when CD8 cells were added, so then nothing ha happened there and the CD8 cells were not killing uh, those uh, uh, fibroblasts. But actually quite interestingly, so uh, with the increasing effect of target ratio, we can see that those CD4 cells were able to kill those patients' own uh, fibroblasts. And, and this is just a picture showing that those, uh, uh, the cells were not any longer there as, as a monolayer. We, we also did this uh, with the um, healthy control cells, and, and we didn't uh, observe uh, like the killing of uh, if you used, we got fibroblasts from healthy control, CD4 and CD8 from healthy control, but they were not killing uh, their own fibroblast cells. Also, if we consider that usually uh, CD4 cells should uh, recognize the target antigens in HLA2, but as these are now cytotoxic uh, CD4 cells, and, and there has been publications showing that uh, cytotoxic uh, CD4 cells could also probably recognize the antigen in the uh, HLA-1. So there, therefore, we incubated these cells in the presence of HLA-1 and HLA-2 antibodies. And it was interesting to see that now when blocking the HLA-1, then we uh, decreased the killing of these CD4 cells. And, and that was not happening uh, in the presence of HLA-A2 antibodies. So suggesting that probably uh, the MHC-1 is mediating this uh, killing uh, of these cytotoxic uh, CD4 cells. We also analyzed uh, the drug sensitivity profile. So we used uh, this uh, uh, platform, which is consisting of uh, 500 different drugs, which is usually used for the cancer cell purposes. But now we analyzed so what drugs are able to kill or affect uh, these uh, abnormal CD4 cells. And it was interesting to see actually that uh, the mTOR inhibitors, they were not as effective for these patient cells as for the donor cells. But then the HSP90 inhibitors, they were more effective against uh, these uh, uh, patient uh, cells. And, and here are just examples uh, of how, how those uh, cells were killed uh, better uh, with these HSP90 inhibitors. We also looked uh, in, in the actual patient cells uh, and, and also uh, with this uh, mutant construct, uh, how they effective. And these mTOR inhibitors were able to actually inhibit the mTOR. Uh, so, sorry, these HSP90 inhibitors were able to inhibit this mTOR pathway, whereas this mTOR uh, inhibitor, serolimus, uh, it was only uh, able to inhib inhibit this mTOR1 signaling, uh, which is seen here uh, in the decrease of this S6K1, but not the mTOR2 pathway. And therefore, probably this HSP90 inhibitor was more effective. And that was also seen here with the patient cells so that, that was able to in, inhibit the, both uh, uh, mTORC1 and mTORC2. So as, as a conclusion, of course, these are just like an example. And, and, and as I said in the beginning, I, I think that we still need to really cover more, a lot more from, from the tip of the iceberg. But what is currently known is that, of course, somatic mutations are occurring in the normal tissues, in normal cells and also in the immune cells, uh, in, in T cells, but also in the myeloid cells. They are able to affect like the phenotype of the cells and the function of the cells. And I think that we need to just learn much more how uh, they are affecting uh, uh, the, the function and, and, and what is their association to different diseases. Also, the antigen target, of course, in these T cells is, is uh, in many times it's un unknown, and, and that would be really important to know to, to understand better the, the function in the, and the mechanism pathophysiologies. And also, uh, 
what, what is like uh, causing these mutations? So is it normally just the aging process? Is it this rapid proliferation during the immune response? Are, are there some uh, uh, endogenous or uh, other uh, antigens? What, what are there? But I think that this all like uh, creates possibilities for all, also novel uh, drug discovery. Uh, for example, what we observed there in this graft versus host disease patient and, and uh, then providing uh, personalized treatment uh, options for, for these patients. So I would like to stop here and, and thank you, especially all, all our uh, group members, very talented PhDs, postdocs, and many uh, of our collaborations around the uh, world and, and, and for our funding sources. And, and thank you for, for listening. We're happy to answer the questions. Thank you, Satu, for... for in amazing, inspiring talk. So really, really lots have happened in, in, in just a few recent years and, and, and so much new, new information and, and, and knowledge has come out of these studies. So it's really exciting. Um, I would like to ask now the audience that could you please raise your hands using that raise hand function. I'm trying to monitor to see you would have any questions, comments to Satu. Can, can you, Anne? Oh, there is, yes, now I can see. Rahul, please. Rahul Piradar, please. Uh, thank you. Excellent talk, Satu. And uh, my question is regarding the cytotoxicity you mentioned in the last part. And it's coming from mainly CD4 cytotoxic T cells. So what's happening to CD8 cytotoxic T cells? Are they even functional in that case or? Yeah, because in general, the cytotoxic is known more about CD8 cells. And... Yes, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, so in these other cases, so usually we, we we found like that those clonal expansions are occurring there in the CD8 cells, and, and those are, are also very often the cytotoxic uh, uh, CD8 T cells. But, but this last part was more related probably to this one particular case. So that in, in that patient, uh, that patient had this CD4 cell clone, and, and that was like apparently uh, cytotoxic. So I think like that those mutations have impacted that CD4 poor cell function and, and first of all allowed that uh, clone to expand and, and also probably get uh, require that aberrant cytotoxic phenotype. And there we could also see that, for example, this Cranzyme B, uh, it was highly expressed in the CD8 cells. So uh, not only in the CD4 cells, but, but like in CD4 cell side, uh, there was this uh, apparent clonal uh, expansion and, and, and also the expression of these highly cytotoxic uh, genes there. Uh, in that clone. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Just if, because I, if I don't see the, your hand, so, so just speak. Put your mic on, uh, microphone on and, and uh, camera on. So maybe I, I could ask, so, so now, most of the sequencing, to my understanding, was, was done either with panels or, or exome sequencing. But then how about the non-coding part of the, the genome? Like there, there are so many regulatory regions there. So, so have people looked into you? You mentioned that in some, some uh, condition also, also genome-wide had been carried out. I guess it, it will be, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that will be really, really the future. So of course, we also started like from these targeted panels. So we first included this one exomic areas of 1000 genes and, and already that created a huge amount of the data. And, and the difficulty was that when we started uh, from like a pool of CD4 cells or CD8 cells, so they are so heterogeneous so that, that we needed to have a really deep sequencing and at least that time when we did it, that we couldn't afford doing like a whole genome sequencing. So we needed to first start with these panels. But, uh, but definitely, I think that it will go more first to the 
genome wide, but but then to this uh, like uh, yeah other regions than the the exons and and there is a lot to, to discover and, and and really it's it will be really interesting to see what is coming out in the future. Now all these great publications showing these mutations in the normal cells, but but these are also first looking for example the cancer mutations and then saying that yes they are there, but but what is really their function and and how they are functioning in different conditions i think it's totally not known yet and be interesting to to discover more and and it was amazing to see in your in this graph where where when we turned 70 was it 70 where there is a blast of these mutations coming up and then when we reach 100 years we are there is amazing large numbers of them and and so so if it's if it's everywhere these mutations form so so what keeps it in control and and so so it's something else than the mutations themselves yeah but yeah yeah of course it's 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 really something else and i have been or wondering all the time so actually what is the difference between the cancer and, and other you see other tissues and, and as, as it's not probably well it's probably the combination with with the environment and, and with the tissue structure and, and all with these uh, different uh, things uh, what what is happening there but uh, for example this clonal hematopoiesis that has been shown to be related to the to the uh, our telomer uh, telomeres so that probably when the telomeres are, are shortening so then uh, the the repair mechanisms are not working and therefore we are, we are getting more of these mutations and, and probably it's, it's part of like this aging process that is that is happening and, and that can be I mean, it is normal process, but but still, I think that it will have impact um, in uh, different physiologies, and and just we need to learn learn a lot more. Amazing, <laughs> exciting. So, do you have other comments, questions to to Satu? I think we have have uh, yeah. Please, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm Anna Anne. Yes, uh, please. And I would like to ask that how uh, far do you think that we are from this uh, personalized medicine approach? Uh, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis today, you give a, a drug and then you have to uh, wait a uh, quite a long uh, period of time for the patient to see that does this drug do anything for the patient? And uh, where do you think that it is susceptible to, to um, uh, make these um, 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 sequencing analysis of the patient before you you, you choose the, the drug, and do you see that it's coming, and in in what time period do you think? Yeah, of course, this is the like the question of of the larger perspective, like that we have these treatment protocols and and. Uh, currently like this kind of investigational treatments, we are not allowed to use them uh, as we need to follow uh, like the approved treatments that have been shown in, in large the clinical trials. But I, I think that probably this will also be changing in, in the future as, as these clinical trials, we are not any longer to test one drug in, in 100 patients, but, but we need to individual, individualize those better. But I'm, I'm not really able to see how, how fast this is happening. But I, I think already now we are able to, to do some of these more personalized options in the case when we do not get like the optimal treatment in, in the first place. But of course, that's un unfortunate that we need to wait for that long. And, and hopefully, like 10 years, we, we, we would be able to move this more, more forward to the, uh, in the first line setting also these more personalized uh, approaches. Thank you, sounds really. Really great. <laughs> so, um, if we have no other questions, I would then like to, to thank, first of all, very much uh, Satu for excellent talk, really amazing. And, and then uh, remind um, everyone, please come back. Uh, we will have in October, November and December also seminars. And, and the next one in October 19th will be by Ilka Juntila and he coming, coming from, from University of Tampere. And, and then Rita Veiola will follow in, in November from University of Oulu talking about deep cohort. And, and then uh, Tuure Kinnunen uh, from University of Eastern Finland uh, talk also about type 1 diabetes and, and immune 
studies and, and diesel studies. So, so I hope to see you all here on a monthly basis. But today, thank you everyone for, for coming and, and thank you Satu again for your talk. Bye. Thank you.